Welcome to the Exponentially Me podcast. Have you ever wondered if we can work better, if we get along better, and if leaders can really influence that? In this podcast, these are some of the questions we will be answering. We'll be talking to some amazing people from all around the world, not just thinkers on this, but the doers, giving you practical information that can make you a better colleague and even a better leader. Hi, my name is Exxon Deval, and I've been pondering this quote by John Quincy Adams. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, are you a leader? Well, if that's the case, then my guest today, the Queen of Love, is a definite leader. Her recent success on TikTok, where she shares the love that her and her family experience and that they share with each other and show to each other has helped her become a phenomenon. But she's more than that. She started her journey on the slopes of Mount Kenya and moved to Europe eventually, where she's not only a speaker and mother, but also works in a highly intensive job. She's been the author of three books so far about healthy marriage, which has been well received. She's also the European coordinator of Women in Business Network, helping provide women business access to European market opportunities. To list everything she has to do or has done will probably take the entire podcast. So let's rather listen to what she has to say. Well, we start off in the podcast by trying to figure out what love is and where love resides within business. Beatrice talks about how there's four pillars to love. And when you're married to your business partner and you involve your children in the business, how does that work? Well, she's had some experience in that and she shares with us how that goes. We then sort of look at what happens in hostage negotiations to take a side turn, and how that can maybe be related to teenagers. We look into cognitive empathy and family relationships. And then we conclude by talking about how random acts of kindness can make such a wonderful change in people. Love. Tell me a little bit more about what you believe love is. That's a beautiful question. I love it. I love it. I have been asked this question for so, so many times. And it's amazing because growing up, actually I come from Kenya, first and foremost. I grew up on the slopes of Mount Kenya, enjoying a lot of love. And in this case, I mean just enjoying the environment and being part of it the people around, the culture. And because I grew up on the slopes of Mount Kenya, we used to interact also a lot with animals. And somehow we had to learn how to interact with the animals. So I was interacting with animals, crops, people, culture, food. And I think this is where my journey for love and quest for love really started. And then I realized after some time that actually love is so unique. So I decided to take it upon myself to dive into a research of what love is all about. What is love? So I did my PhD and actually my research is on emotional intelligence. And to me, emotional intelligence is all about love. Four pillars, that's what they call them. But the four pillars, according to me, is loving yourself, loving others, loving what you do, and loving the outcome. The word love. But now the question is, what is love? I was asked that question last night by a beautiful, beautiful teenager I was talking to yesterday. And she asked me, what is love, by the way? What is this love? What is it? And I looked at her on the face and I told her, love is not a feeling. She's like, oh, really? No? Okay. Then I 
told her love is not an action. Oh, Lily, so why do you say that? I can have a feeling of love, but I'm abusive. I can show acts of kindness, but I'm abusive. So what is love? And I looked at her on the eyes and I said, love is a greater force than all of us. It's beyond all of us. Love is our core being. It's who we are in our totality. And so we all have it. So love is completely based on an individual. How do you see love? Depending on your culture, your beliefs, how you grew up, how you're wired, it's based on an individual. To me personally, love is like a God to me. It's everything. Whatever I do has to be motivated or from the angle of love. If I don't love it, I don't do it. Right. The thing is, what it calls up for me is if you, listening to you talking about um, we grew up, I grew up close to Gaborone in South Africa, so in a, in a, in a rural community as well. And what I found fascinating is that sense of community, that sense of feeling love from everyone around you. Right. It, it's like you're not it, like you're not alone. And I think from my nanny's um, family, I felt it even more because it was not just my family, which is normally in the white culture that, that you're, it's your closest family, but for me with Letta, it always felt as if it wasn't just her that loved me. It was yes. like her whole family loved me. Is the whole family and it. And it was really special. And, and it's something that I think we, in the West, we, we've become so individualistic that we think about the one-to-one -one interactions, but not the community feel. Yes, I think that community feel is so, so important in our lives. I was just discussing with my husband the other day, and I was saying that growing up in the village, we used to walk to school. And we used to have uniforms. So... If anyone found me straying and walking, for example, in the marketplace at 10 o'clock, they'll be like, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be in school. Are you okay? There was that sense of love all around and caring and nurturing. And I'm just saying, I think this is what I am missing. And because of that, the ripple effect is going so deep into our homes because we don't have that anymore. So we're seeing husbands and wife tearing each other. We're seeing kids suffering because that sense of community is no longer there. And that's why for me, the four pillars of love the first one is loving yourself. The second one is loving others. Even before we think of loving what you do, which is work, and enjoying even what you do, it's so, so important that we feel like we belong. We need to sort of cut those traits of individualism because if it starts with me and you, the ripple effect goes all the way to the homes. And I believe so strongly that a family, a home, is the pillar of the society. And so if we can bring back love, back home, then we'll make a big difference. I find it interesting because so the, the, so a lot of the stuff that I do with leadership is to look at what is the connection between us at work because people tend to spend so much time at work. Now with COVID, a lot of people are working from home, so it's a different dynamic. But before that, all of us spent time at work and the majority of the time that we spent at work was actually more than the time we spent with our families. Right. And if we then have a compassionless, a loveless, a, a clinical relationship with our work and our colleagues, it almost felt like there was something missing. I, love I mean, that. you're running a business with your family. So, I mean, it's like you, you have your, your husband your, and your two kids involved in that as well. So how do you guys do love at work? 
isn't it amazing? Because when you're asking that, something came into mind. So I have been working with my husband since we got married. So in a sense, there has always been an opportunity for us to work together as a family. Even if on top of that, we do have our normal jobs, five, I mean, eight to five. And so in that sense, we have had kind of a feel of the two environments, having an eight to five job and also working together as a family. And there's something I realized that when it comes to being in the office, my own relationship with my supervisor is so, so important, as well as my relationship back home. And depending on how I relate on my, I mean, with my supervisor, to some extent, it also affects what I bring back home. So there's that deep correlation between the two, between the family love and business. The two are so heavily correlated, they cannot work without each other. We need it in the workplace. We need supervisors who understand, who can focus on relationships and connection. And also back home, we also need it so that we can live together in harmony as a unit. I think it's there's something interesting you're touching on there, and that is that the idea of work and home life being separate. Um, I think especially now with us working from home a lot, I think it's been shown that we we can't really separate those two because you're still the same person. It doesn't matter if you're at work or at home. That's right. That is it. That is it. Uh, I mentioned that we've been working together with my husband and it's so interesting because thinking of it, we have been doing family business together. But at the same time, we have also been in offices together. So our first job was with the United Nations, ICTR Arusha. So he got the job and I got the job in the same organization. And then from there, we got an opportunity to come to Europe. And we work for the same organization as well. And I can tell you when COVID hit, we received so many comments on our channel, how families are fighting. They cannot work together. Divorce rates went so high. It's amazing the conflict. I was talking with my colleagues left, right and center. And they were all having issues with their children at home, with their teenagers, working in the same environment with their husbands for their first time. And one of them was like, you know what, Beatrice, it's even very funny that my kids don't even tend to see their dads often, their dad often. And so one of them was like, you know what, mommy, I think I've forgotten who this man is. So thanks to COVID that I can see him often now. So we've been getting these kind of comments. But for us on the other side, what I realized is that whilst we had to struggle to get space for each one of us, that was the problem. It was not more of the relationship or how to work together because we are used to driving together to work and coming back together. I have a phone call, I can reach him anytime. We could go for a cup of tea, you know, because we work in the same office, the same building, let me say that. If it was the same, maybe office, it would be disastrous. Yes, 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 the same building. I mean, the same building. So in a sense, what this has done is when we started our family business, we realized there was some easy flow along with it. So we are able to listen to each other. We are able to plan, execute. I'm not going to say that it's 100% easy. There are always some challenges here and there. And thanks to XT for helping us to figure out some things and making it even easier and bearable for us to you know, some extent. But in a sense, there is that feeling of if you are working together as a family and you're also working in a work environment, 
whatever happens around you affects you emotionally. And so if there can be a bit of understanding and love around it, it would make each one of us as an individual a better person. I agree with that. And the, the thing is, yeah, I loved work. I, I love working with you and your family. They're, they're just, you're just a really, really, you live love. And I think that is so beautiful to see. What I always see in, in families, in, in family businesses and um, in people that have worked together for a long time is that sometimes relationship systems develop um, that are not necessarily healthy hmm. and that we need to sometimes look at do we not need to change that system? Because it's not the individual we need to change. It is the interaction that's causing the problem. So when people say, yeah, if he were only to do that or she was only to do that, very often it has nothing to do with the thing that needs that they want done. It just has to do with, I don't feel recognized. I don't feel seen. And at the core of it is, I don't feel love, you know? And I think when we do that in work as well, what leaders tend to forget is that we, whatever we say as a leader in an organization, you can basically multiply the impact by 10. So for every layer in the organization, add a megaphone, you know, and it's so, it's so heavy that if you're, if a leader that you report into tells you that you've done something wrong, it feels 10 times heavier than if a colleague told you that. And so, I, I mean, in African culture, it has to do with seniority as well. So for if your grandfather or your father or your mother were to say something or an auntie, it weighs a lot heavier than somebody right next to you, sure. you know? And so, so how do you think, what can, what can we learn from, that hierarchical almost structure also in, in African society and how that still bridges with love. What do you think we can t maybe take from that to, to apply to businesses in Europe? That's a very good question, Extin. I love it. I love it because um, growing up uh, in Africa has really shaped me in a very, very different way. And I'm going to say why. Having lived in Africa and worked in different African countries and getting an opportunity to come and live in Europe, the difference was like day and night. So first I came here with my energy, always smiling and, you know, saying hello to everybody, giving gifts, and which is not bad. But then I realized after some time, there's some sense of coldness here. There's some sense of coldness where people are not so appreciative. And I remember at one point, it was over Easter, and we had little gifts to give to our neighbors here. And so we distributed the gifts. But one of our neighbors, an elderly lady, actually brought the gift back and said she doesn't need it. And the kids are like, mommy, did she just return it? Is it because what did we do wrong? And all of a sudden it dawned on me that, okay, okay, we are actually in a different environment where someone can actually feel intruded by you giving them a gift. Just knocking at their door and them not coming even to receive it, just putting it on the door hole, when they got it, they felt like, no, I don't deserve this. I don't, I don't know what they felt because I didn't ask, but I can only assume. But looking back and thinking about it, if it was an African family or maybe an elderly African lady, she would have even kept it and said, it's a matter of the heart. When this person was giving me this gift, the heart was in the right place. They thought well of me. Now, that was my first shock when I came here. And then over COVID, during this pandemic, we were seated here at home. I like using stories to teach. So I was seated here at home and it was the eve of the new year, 2020. 
and I was just preparing myself. And I asked my hubby to help me with my afro. Because, I, you know, I'm coming behind to make me look nice, prepare for the new year, 2020. Mm. And our daughter captured that moment. And I asked her later, why did you do that? And she said, I found that so special. She captured it and then she put it on social media. And I'm bringing this at this point because of the comments that we received. The comments that we received. Little did we know that breaking even those high hierarchical barriers and doing something so, so simple, yet, yet so powerful. We didn't even know it was powerful, by the way, until when the millions and millions of people started writing to us. And I was like, what is this feeling that just coming and Naflo is bringing to these human beings? What is it? It's that feeling of love being nurtured. Not even saying a word. And that's when I realized that, like you rightfully said, there's something we are missing. And I think there are a couple of things we can learn from our African heritage. And that is the sense of community. Putting yourself in the other person's shoes. What would I do? How would they feel? Can I just show an act of appreciation? When I go to the village, when I visit my neighbors, they will use the only coin they have to buy me a Fanta, a soda, a Coca-Cola, so that I can drink it. And I'm there thinking, this person has used maybe even the last coin they have in their pocket to make me feel good. I think that's where we should go back to. I agree. It, it's for me, I have... My story is slightly different, but it, in, in the same in, in the same vein, when I came to Europe, it what I found fascinating is that you can go party in South Africa. I would go partying out at night and go leave with two or three friends, and then the following morning you arrive with half a dozen or a dozen or more people back home, and it's like, um, "Mum, breakfast, please," you know, <laughs> and it would just be okay. You know, it'll, it'll be okay it will to be. meet people, connect with people, and show vulnerability and, 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 and have multiple connections with people that you don't know from a bar of soap. You just reach out and there's somebody there you can talk to, you know. And when I came here, it was a case of, yes, we'll meet at a bar and then we'll meet for coffee and then we'll meet some more and more and more. And eventually we'll, after three months of knowing you really well, we might invite you for coffee and a biscuit and then you've got to go again. There you go. Completely different culture. I mean, we also have more space in Africa. Yeah, there's a lot less space, so people are a bit more protective of their space. But it was just weird for me. And, and so when I started seeing this in business happening as well, where people say, it's almost like, there's the space is very small. Yes. Okay, that's my space, but it is very well protected. So having a conversation that crosses that barrier, talking about stuff that is important, that hurts you, upsets you, frustrates you, it's just not done. I thought myself, how do you how do you commute how do you connect? Why would people want to do anything with you if you if there's no connection? And then we talk about yes, teams form over eighteen months or stuff like that. You go, no, but it just we can do the same in two months. Just start right. talking, you know? Right. And so that showing of that compassion, that showing of caring, you know, the, mm. the, the, the small acts of human kindness, mm. which we take for granted in Africa, here we need to teach people how to do that. And I think it's beautiful to see the response. And so that video of, of your husband combing your hair, it was just, it was so compassionate. It was so loving. It was so... um in a way also vulnerable that I think it, I mean, I didn't even see the video. I need to got to know you without the video. And then I spoke to some, some kids that I know and they went like, Oh my God, did you see the video? And I had to go watch it and go like, Oh, this is so beautiful. It's just that, that showing of that compassion. And I'm just thinking 
shouldn't we, doing, we be doing that as leaders within organizations? Shouldn't we be showing compassion and care for everybody that's been entrusted into our care so that those that observe it can go, yes, we do care and can take that example. Have you seen people doing things like that or what are your thoughts about it? That's a good question, Extain, because um, I remember the first time I received a gift from my supervisor, it made the whole wide world of difference. And she actually bought me a cuddle, beautiful cuddle, and um, it was a Christmas gift. And my supervisor is so good. She's beautiful and I love her so much. She is Dutch. And I come from Africa. So that cultural difference. And so with her, it's spot on, straightforward, really blank, like that is it. It has to be done this way. No more negotiations, nothing. I said this, Beatrice, it has to be done this way. For me, I'm used to something different. Yes, Beatrice, I hear you and I understand where you're coming from. What if then we can do it this way? Or have you thought actually about doing it this way? Different tone, different command. You arrive at the same thing, but it's completely different. Now, I have also learned to also adjust and try to understand the other cultures. So having been here now for about over 10 years, I've learned a lot about the culture here. So I'm also trying to adjust a little bit. But I like that idea of bringing empathy, that relationship connection in the office. Because you rightfully said, we spend more hours in the office than at home. And at one point we were joking with my hubby and saying, you know what, we dress smartly going to the office and dress funny, shabby, everything, name it, when we are at home. Why don't we do the same? So that we respect the moments we are together also at home. But you're right, free, right. You know that actually most of the people are married to their offices. Really, really. And so if we can bring an environment back in the office where people feel valued, feel appreciated, listened to, it would actually make a big difference in the community as well. Would have people who appreciate more. And one of the topics I was dealing with at some point is how to deal with these cultural differences. Being more emphatic, you know, where you're able to show empathy more. Show empathy, listen to people more, be more understanding, try to meet each other at the middle. And I think that speaks it all. I think you, you're, you're, you have some very interesting point there because empathy is also attached for me to compassion. So if we can be compassionate, we can accept differences because then somebody doesn't have to look like us, doesn't have to act like us, doesn't have to do what we do to be valued because we can value them for their uniqueness. And so next to that is empathy. And what has been really fascinating for me is, is to see empathy or cognitive empathy, ability to see other people's emotions is actually an ability and we can improve it. Um, we, we, we might not, there's a genetic component, the social component. And I mean, we, um, if you don't have the genetic component, you don't have it, you know, you, there's not much you can do about it. But majority of us, almost 70% of us fall into a category where the majority of those genes are switched on. So we can, and we can learn how to make that better. And one of the drawbacks for that is that we also tend to imprint on our primary caregiver when we're like three, six, five, eight months old, you know, and then everybody that looks like a primary caregiver, we can see the emotions more easily. So yes. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. I grew up in Africa because my nanny being black and my mom being white, I could start reading faces across the boundaries, you know? So, but what made it really heavy or, or difficult was that people around me couldn't. 
And so when you see somebody's hurting or somebody is struggling and nobody else sees it, how do you then communicate with that? And if we bring that into the work environment, we say, well, but there are people that see better and there are people that notice things. Okay, exactly. Shouldn't we give those people a voice so to, to help us, the rest of the people that cannot see very well, to be more compassionate, to be more able to allow room for that difference? Because if we can, if we can't see, at least maybe we should listen to the people that can see the emotions. I like that. That's really beautiful because. It's one of the traits we look for when we are hiring um, human resources uh, because HR in an organization is very, very important because they're dealing with individuals, they're dealing with the souls, they're dealing with emotions. And one of the things that has been very well emphasized um, in my organization is team building. And what this has helped us do is to try and bring all the cultures together and be able to express ourselves in a more open and relaxed environment. Because our organization is an international organization with, I think, a representation for majority of the countries. And so what that tended to do at the beginning, especially when they set up the organization, was that there were a lot of conflicts. People felt they're not understood. People felt they're not connecting. And that's when I realized how the Dutch community can be disciplined in terms of being in the office on time, going for their lunch break at exactly noon, coming back to the office and leaving, leaving on time. While the other cultures, for them, it's really like more easygoing, but they will end up really accomplishing their tasks. So because of all these differences, we started to introduce what we're calling team building and bringing people like Extin who can come and help us to really dig deep into our relationships and seeing how can we connect with each other better. So those kind of um, team building exercises, we are usually, they're usually very relaxed. Okay, well, during COVID, we didn't have any. Usually very relaxed, maybe we are cooking or we are at the beach, but at the end of the day, then we bring someone like Extin who can now help us to really diagnose the real issues. But what that also did, it helped me understand my colleagues even more. I was able to see the expressions, especially for me. It's so, so important to interact more with my colleagues. Um, just to see their facial expressions, just to understand them. And I remember realizing, oh my goodness, this is how my colleague is when they're happy and relaxed, jumping, laughing. They can actually laugh that deep love and you feel it coming out. Because you're always seeing them in the office just, you know, like focused, so serious. So I like what you're saying that at some point, even in the organizations, we need to think of about the human element and how important it is. We do have the goals that have been set, that's fine. We have the organization with its own needs, but what about the human beings in it? The human asset, how do we handle it? Because if we deal with the human asset in the office, and when they go home, they're fighting an environment where they have their partners to also actually just add on to that through their love relationship. We can go deep and deep into this, the kind of emotions, the, 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 the kind of feelings it all brings when you feel loved by your partner. And then you bring now the element from the office where your supervisor, your colleagues understand you. I think it would be a better society than we are. I think it can also make a huge difference, yes. I think what, what, what I found fascinating in, in the research in the last few years is that they, they, they did a study at 23andMe, the, the DNA company with um, Baron Cohen, his professor in the UK. Yeah around cognitive empathy and the, and the genes element. 
and they've, the, the, his background is in autism. So he wow. looks at people with, with autism. And so people that are struggling, for instance, yeah. to read pe people's faces. The strange thing, which I, I don't think they quite expected, but which they discovered is that when all these genes are sort of aligned, um, you also get people completely on the other side of the spectrum. So people on the one side may be struggling, but people on the other side are completely almost like superhuman in their ability to read people's emotions. Now let's think of, just think for a moment, what does that mean? If I have these people that are, they're not the majority, they're a very small percentage, but they are amazing at this. They're mm. amazing at seeing, seeing facial expressions. So if we go for the negative, or let's say the more negative impact maybe, would that be a good hostage negotiator? Ooh, would that yeah. make a good clinical psychologist? And then what we use it now for in, in um, especially places like banking or pharmaceutical companies, we have a lot of people that can be a little bit nerdy or very numbers focused and very sort of focused on, on what they need to do. We need to have more innovation there. And sometimes we need to get more ideas on the table. And so what we do is we get people to do, run the process, but put somebody with high cognitive empathy in as an observer. Because they can see the emotions. They can see when somebody gets frustrated with the direction of thought. They can see when there's somebody who goes like, oh, that person's sitting with an idea. And they've actually done some research. I think it was at Harvard where they basically combined, or was, was MIT, we'll link the study in the, <laughs> in the text, um, where they showed that women or teams with women tend to be better at complex problem solving. And I went like, okay, but how many more women? And it just got, got like more women, more women, more women. And I went like, well, what's happening here? Why is this coming to the fore? And then what they figured out is that cognitive empathy, women tend to be slightly better than that, uh, mm. with, with that than men. So because there was more noticing of ideas that people were sitting with that's not getting on the table, there was more engagement than asking for those ideas, which meant they were able to solve problems faster and better because they had more solutions on the table. Mm. And so in innovation, if you really want to have not just the diversity, we also need to bring in the thoughts that might not be coming to the table. And so I think this ability to be compassionate and, and see other people's, other people's emotions allows us to bring those ideas on the table, but also allows the room for people to express them. And so for me, this love you're talking about, the compassion element of that is giving people the room and allowing them to, to bring your, your, their, their ideas. I don't know if you've seen similar stuff with um, where you are. Yes, I have. And I think um, one of the examples that also brings me back home is an experience I had here at home with our children when they were going through teenagehood. And actually, I gave that face a name and I called it the volcano, the volcanic face. Because it was exactly that. So one evening, you're well, you bid each other good night, everything is going well, but the following morning, the volcano has erupted. And they're shut down, they're not gonna talk to you, everything you say doesn't make sense, you know nothing, you're all diversioned. And I had to actually learn how to manage them not just to see how they are behaving, but to read between the lines, to look at their face and try to understand what exactly is going on in their minds. And I remember telling my boss at some point that if I have passed through this phase, I think I can head a whole department a whole HR department, if I have managed to deal with two teenagers in my house. Now they are 21 and 24, going to 25. 
and they have turned to be the most beautiful, beautiful beings I could ever have. Very supportive. I get hugs now. I get flowers. But there was a face which I believe was either to make or break. So we had to relearn a few things. And from what we learned, we realized is the same technique that we can lift and actually use back in the office. And it would work very well with our colleagues. And one of them was, and this was through experience, and I respect the fact that there are people you mentioned that actually have this almost like as a gift, inbuilt. And how lovely we need those people in every corner of the world. People who can actually read our own expressions, our own feelings, our emotions from their face and fully understand what our needs are. But what we learned through this experience of teenagehood, first is being just a good observer. Behavior, human behavior. How are they using their hands when speaking to you? How are their eyes? How are their lips? How are the visual expressions? How are their shoulders? Are they sagging? Are they folding their hands tight? Meaning they are closed up. They don't want to open up. They don't want to say anything. Are they opening their eyes wide? And so from that, we learn to be more patient with our kids. Listen more. It came to a point where whatever we said, we knew nothing. So we just had to listen. Just listen and tell them, you know what? I am there for you anytime. I am there for you. Even if the police came knocking at the door, know that I will always protect you. I will always be there for you. And it's amazing how that turned out to be. And then on top of that, we started joking more making fun out of the situations and laughing more. So our son could say something and we just joke around it and make, you know, they say when life gives you lemons, make lemonade and make a website and sell the lemonade, right? So that's what could happen. If they give us those little lemons, we could actually look at them, turn them into a joke and we all laugh. Because otherwise it would have been a very stressful moment, back and forth, conflicts, misunderstandings, them storming out. It would have been very difficult. And it's the same thing in the office. So we learned to be more tolerant, more of an observer. And this has really saved me and my hubby in a big, big way. Because we are also leading teams in the organization. I think what, what you're triggering there for me is that there's a guy called Chris Voss. Um, I mean, he's, he's sort of like a hostage negotiation specialist for a company called Black Swan. And he talks about how he used hostage negotiation techniques with his son. Oh, wow. When he went through puberty. No. Nice. And, and the two things is asking how and what questions only, so nothing that's confrontational but allows for elucidation and more information. And then paraphrasing that, to make sure they got the facts straight. You know? And he said, but a summary was not complete. If you just add paraphrasing, it's not complete. You also need to recognize the emotions or acknowledge yes. the emotions. And what I've learned in the meantime is that it doesn't matter if you're slightly off the mark. If you're slightly wrong in your summary of the facts or the, 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 the the paraphrasing, or you're slightly off on labeling the emotions. Say, for instance, you look angry. Person is like, I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated. You're like, people rectify you. So it doesn't matter if you're not 100% spot on. Show people that you're listening. Show them what you've heard. Show them what, that you'd recognize the feelings. And the moment you do that, they will fix it for you. To, to tell you where you're going wrong. Yes, yes, they do. But they feel heard, you know? Mm. And, and and the moment we feel heard, we feel like we're valued and, and yes. as if we're being seen. And isn't that the most beautiful thing when, for instance, within families, you always, I just think with my mum, I always feel seen. Wow. And if we, we have that in families, that to me is sort of an expression of love. Mm. When you... If you're, prop, if you're really seen, 
Yeah, that, that's that's very, very interesting because there are a few discoveries that we have made working together as a family. And um, some of the discoveries that we have sort of dig out of the ground is, we had to dig out of the ground is that we are different. We are a family, but we are different. And on top of that, we are thinking of a business, working together in a business. And just to bring your point home, at one point we realized, okay, teenagers like sleeping more, so they sleep more. So whilst my husband and I are awake at eight o'clock, and working until late to make sure that we accomplish the office goals and also our own goals. Our wonderful kids are still asleep up to noon. And you're like, oh, when are we gonna deliver? And then again, we realize that is their being. They, they enjoy sleep more. And so we had to sort of come up with a system where we allow them as long as they are meeting their goals, business goals, and also their academic goals, then no problem, as long as they can meet their goals. And this made it easier for us. So instead of having this kind of a thub and rule kind of thing where we are really like forcing them, we had to sort of sit back and meet them, listen more to them and see how can we make it easier for them to accomplish the same goal. So they won't run away from that. They have to accomplish the goal. But with the prevailing conditions, how can we make it easier for them? And I love that idea of going back home and thinking about my mom as well and being this beautiful hardworking lady in the village in a big farm and in this farm, we used to have workers coming in to harvest, let's say, coffee or to black tea. So she used to have a group of women who used to work with her constantly. And whilst it was not in an office, but I learned a lot of management skills from there. First and foremost, the ladies had their time when they have to come. And she was there to make sure that when they come, they get their tea break and they also get their lunch break. Now, what used to happen is that during those breaks, you'll be amazed. These women are talking about their own issues. You know, this is what happened to my husband last night and this is how we had it. This is what happened. I'm still struggling with this. Sometimes I could hear them just laughing, busting into a laughter because one of them has clacked a joke. So those tea times became actually a connecting time. And from that small group, they actually they actually now formed a group now for their children to be meeting. And they used to meet in our house as kids. So we used to meet with their children as well every Sunday morning. So we could come together as kids, sing, have fun. So from that small group of women that come to pluck tea or harvest the coffee, the tea time and the lunch time break, them connecting emotionally, listening to one another, came up with another idea. And it's just amazing what this does, that when I go home, even like I was at home this December, these children that were kids during my time, we still meet now. They were at my house by the time I arrived. So we had fun. So you can see what it means to create that kind of an environment where we can listen to one another, we can nurture one another, we can even laugh, really, cheer. And I think that's what you're driving your point to. I like what you're saying there, because there's two things in there that I would like to highlight. The one for me is when you're talking about your children and the outcomes, the goals, where you basically love the goal, you don't have to hold on to the process. Wow. So that they can find their own processes. They can find their own way of solving the problem and getting to the outcome that is most beneficial. Right. And I think that's something, uh, this book called The CEO Next Door, and that's one of the things they highlight that really good CEOs do mm. is to say, well, 
what is the pro how do I support the process to get to the goal? It doesn't matter if the process change, but the mm. the process needs to support the goal. All right, and and so giving people the freedom to find their own way there, and supporting them to make sure that they can do the best goal achievements than they can, mm. allows us to just let go a little bit mm. of the process and allow them to find a way that's more efficient for them or more effective for them because wow. then they feel a little bit valued. And the other thing you were saying about the, the community, I thought to myself, that sounds like a mastermind group. Well, there you know? you go. I didn't even think of it that way. <laughs> so it's like, instead of getting together and talking about what TV program was on last night, the moment we start sharing what we're struggling with, there's a whole group sitting around us mm. that have experiences or ideas that can give us stuff that we can work with. Even if we say none of that's good enough for us or none of that is something we can apply. If we do not hear those ideas, if we do not make room for them, we don't know where the solutions could have come from. And this is something that, that, that it, on the farm where I grew up after work, I would get after the work day. Cause I mean, did my homework and so on. But between after work day, let's say five, six o'clock and dinner, there was always a few hours. And the farm workers would get together and they'd be cooking around the fire. And I would sneak away and I could sit there because they would be what most people would from the outside looking at would think about of as gossiping yeah. about what happened in the day because they talked about other people and they talked about their experience of the day. But it Looking back, it was sense making. It is trying to take all the actions and the behaviors and figure out what does it mean? And in that moment, sharing trials, tribulations, frustrations, anger, joys, there was lots of laughter. There was also a lot of serious moments, sometimes tears. Somebody's family might have died. So they, they, they all commiserate together, but you always felt part of a community. It always felt like, I do not have to do this alone. Right. And I think when we have that, we can deal with stress a little bit better. And the moment we can deal with stress and cortisol a little bit better, we can be more creative. We can be more welcoming. We can yeah. be more productive. And isn't that what we want in business to have that productivity and yet have an environment where we're not being screamed at? That's it, right? I'm just thinking of this example I just gave of these women that could come together and just open up, just share what they are going through in life. And somehow, somewhat, somewhat within the group always used to have an answer, somehow, somewhat, so they could solve their own issues. Now, assume that is the office, which was the farm in this case. Now, when these women go back home, they meet with their husbands. And this is where the love element comes in. And so all of a sudden, the oxytocin gets lifted in the system, right? Both of them, making them feel good, making them feel happy. Oxytocin is the love hormone. So it makes you feel good. It makes you feel appreciated. In fact, to a man, it brings that emotional connection that men, in a way, have been known to miss, kind of, that emotional connection. Studies have shown that sometimes it's not easy to get that emotion, you know, from, you know. But in a sense, that oxytocin brings this beautiful part of a human being and it suppresses the cortisol, the stress hormone. And so we become all of a sudden a society full of people that are visionary, people that are empowered, and people that are looking forward to another day and even being more productive because all of a sudden Oxytocin brings this feeling of, I can achieve it. I can do it. Nothing is too big. So love, love is so, so important. Outside the home and inside the home. 
I think you're right there. This 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 whole connectedness is one of the things when when I look at teams um, at work and and families that that for me also has that similarity is that when we do random acts of human kindness, it it can be something as small as giving somebody a cup of coffee or mm -hmm. just asking how are you doing today. Just those small acts um, show that we care. Mm -hmm. It's not just that we show show the care between the two of us. If, if I give you a cup of coffee, it also shows to others that see that act yes. that there is this care. And so in families where families show they care, the connections are better. The relationships are better. And so at work, I think it's the same. If when leaders show those small acts of human kindness, take a moment out of their day just to check in with you and see, how are you doing today? I think we can build those strong bonds that allow us to be more resilient, allow us to handle stress better and allow us to be more creative even in times of stress. I agree with you totally because, because during COVID, there's so much that we have learned as a family and also observing the society. So after we released the video of my hubby, brushing, plucking, picking, depending on where you are, my afro, the reactions from that video give us the energy to show more acts of kindness. In our house, because it was full lockdown then, in our house, we should, which could be emulated out there. So it was acts of kindness, little acts of kindness, as little as hugging each other as a family, just hugging each other, or my hubby bringing me a cup of tea. So we could actually video that and put it out there. Our daughter coming in our bedroom and just giving us a hug and saying, I love you. And we could put that video out there. At one point, our son was now also eager. He was like, can I also plug, comb your avlo, you know, my afro. And I was like, go ahead, son. And so it was also captured and put out there. And, you know, you're just putting a video out there, not knowing what it's going to do. And you see the reactions, and I'm really supporting you fully, that those little acts of kindness can mean so, so much to the extent that by the time we're waking up one morning and Oprah Magazine has featured our videos, oh my God, Viola Davis, you're looking at BET International, E! News. And at one point, one of our videos was next to Joe Biden's. And we are thinking, oh my God, Oh my God. And and Michelle Obama and Obama. And we were like, oh yes. And you can see our views were really going like high, like almost one million. And we were like, yes, there is a certain message here. And I'm just echoing what you said, Extin, that rightfully so we need those little acts of kindness, even in the offices. Maybe just bringing me coffee or just let's say just helping me with something or just coming and asking me, oh, how are you doing today? And, you know, simple acts of kindness. They don't even have to cost anything. And I think if the society can embrace that even more, that means everything. And I'm going to share something that happened. Um, my mom passed away uh, about seven years ago. And so I told my neighbors, I mean, this who I am, I'm so open. So I told my neighbors. But the same lady who returned the gift some time back, when I told her, she shed tears and gave me a hug. I think that is so beautiful a moment. Isn't it, it? It, it, yes. But it also brings us full circle. And that is that it doesn't matter what you put out into the world, at some point it comes back. 
So let's all go out there and put some love into this world. Let's put some yes. compassion into the world yes. and give a hug, give a cup of coffee and ask how someone is doing and trigger their oxytocin and ours and those that observe it. And I think, yeah, thank you for coming today. Thank you for um, making this a special moment and sharing a little bit of your kindness with us. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you so much, Extine. I'm really, really honored. Yes, yes, being with you. I know you have been part of this journey with us. You have helped my family in so many ways to discover who we are, to even make this journey together. And you actually made it so easy for us to kind of know how to connect with one another and how to work together. I do really, really appreciate those moments. The moments we've been together recording videos, I really, really do honor that. And I'm really honored to have been featured on this podcast. Thank you so very much. I'm wondering, does the phrase leadership is a relationship hold the same across cultures? When we talk about connected leadership, is that a hypothesis that we can carry forward to talk about the universal human connection and need within leadership? Well, when we spoke about the differences between Africa and Europe in terms of relationships, it seems like the gap is less than what we expect it to be. Workplaces in Africa can be much more complex than it is in Europe, where a lot of things are rule-based, skills-based, and not so much relationship-based. Can we find motivations, incentives, and different ways of connecting by looking at the social, by looking at the way in which we could use novel experiences of connection where leaders can lead with compassion, with connection, and with understanding of the human condition, where we connect socially in an African social mindset. What is your understanding of Ubuntu? Now go out there, be exponential, and do something nice for someone else. You can find us on the web by going to podcast.exponentially.me We will also find additional media resources and some amazing insights.